Thank you so much, Jim. Thank you. Thank you so much for coming. And uh, she introduced me. I will have to tell you more a little bit about this lady. Uh, I have never wanted to do this, okay? I am the youngest Holocaust survivor. This is Marcy Rosenberg. She was the one that got me to do all this. Otherwise, I'd have never done it. I don't dwell on the past. Uh, I am 78 years old. I may not look it. Most people say I don't. Uh, I've been in a camp in Germany since the war started, which is 1939 to 1945. Uh, this lady is one of the most charming ladies that you ever want to meet. Uh, when I came to the United States in 19, the end of 1957, I worked for a long time and then things got a little better. I worked very, very hard and I went on a cruise. I'm sure if some of you young people have ever been on a cruise. You have? Okay, I was on a cruise and I will never forget it as long as I live. Uh, I'm leading up to something. And uh, the ship was called the Princess. It was a 17,000 ton. It held 700 passengers and there was a crew of 350. And they were all Filipinos. And what they did to the people, including my wife and myself, was unbelievable. The kindest people in the world that I have ever met. Because we're all people, we're all kind. But the reason I'm saying this, the lady that you have just met that introduced me is one of those people. The other Filipinos couldn't hold a candle to that lady, the work that she does. Okay? So I just wanted to mention that. Marcy, I hope you don't mind. Thank you so much. She's the one that got me to do this. Uh, we have made a tape, what she encouraged me to do, which <clears throat> I'm sure you've heard of Spielberg. Have you, okay, he's the one that started it, and this lady also. So let me tell you a little bit about my, myself. Um, when the Germans came into my town, which is called Benjin, Poland, it's approximately about 18 kilometers from Leipzig. Anybody know a little geograph <coughs> geography? You know where Leipzig is? I've been there. You've been there? Who is that that's been there? Oh, is that right? Okay, so I'm about 18 kilometers from Leipzig. So when the war started, it wasn't but 10, 15 minutes, and the Germans were in my town, which is called Benjin. And of course, the minute we came in, they, they knew exactly where to go and what to do. They rounded up all, a lot of, whatever they could round up as far as the Jewish people were concerned, okay? Um, I come from a family. I had two brothers, a sister, and myself. My mother and father. My mother and three others were taken away, and I was taken away with my dad. We went on separate trucks. My mother and other siblings went a separate way. They went to Auschwitz. Anybody heard of Auschwitz? I'm sure you have. Okay. I went with my dad to a forced labor camp, which was called Jelishnya. Approximately maybe, you know, I was a kid, nine years old, little. And we went, which was called a forced labor camp. They call it, in German, it's called a Zwangslager. And uh, they were preparing us for various things, you know. When I was a kid, anyway, I once mentioned this. I was, I was nine years old, a little past nine. My father was a big man. I was probably equal to a 15-year-old as far as height was. I was a very big, big kid. My father weighed about 350 pounds. So it started as a forced labor camp. We used to do various things. I didn't do too much. I used to clean the office clean the Germans' boots and all that, and you know. So as the year, months went on, we were moved to a, another camp. The war was getting a little rougher, so we went to a place called Blechhammer. And then we started to go to factories. 
all the you know the Jews mainly we went to different places that they put the people to work you know I didn't know what what was what some of them were making ammunition they were doing various parts to for the war and you know and as the months went on they turned it into worse and worse. As, as the months went on, it was getting worse and worse, okay? So we spent there probably about six or seven months, and we went to a place called Buchenwald. And this is when it all started, okay? They, um, big wire, okay? Uh, eight, ten feet tall, they had watchtowers, you know, set up and it was started to get like a regular concentration camp. And then when, this is when we got our numbers, you see it? So after so many years, it kind of fades away. My number is 178873. They take your arm like this, and they press it tight and they just poke the needle, you know, into your arm. And this is what I got. Uh, we went to work. Uh, we used to sleep four or five in a bed. Uh, not a bed, but bunk beds. On straw, whatever was available. And it was, it was hell on earth. I hope none of you will ever see something like that as horrifying as what we went through. Uh, we used to march. Every morning we'd get up, three o'clock, stand to attention. I really don't know how many thousands was really there, you know. Could have been maybe five, seven, eight thousand, you know, in a camp. And after we were all counted, we went out, walked, you know. What we have on our back, what you saw, the striped uniforms, you saw all the pictures, right? We had wooden, wooden shoes, you know, and it was cold, hot, cold, it don't make any difference. We marched three miles to work, and we worked like mules, believe me. I was always, luckily enough, I was able to do different things because, I guess, because of my youth and all that. I, why I'm here today, I, have to, I haven't yet, yet figured that out yet. But the others worked, it worked hard, from 3 o'clock in the morning till sometimes 7, 8 o'clock at night, and we marched home, hail, rain, or snow. But one thing you made sure you don't do, if you drop, you'll be shot and kicked aside, okay? That's how tough it was. So, you know, I'm trying to crowd in six years into a half hour or 40, 45 minutes. It's very, very tough. And one of the worst things that used to happen uh, during bombardment, as I say our Americans, because I'm an American, okay? They came and they used to bomb the place. And when they bombed the place, if they would get a chance, they would fog up the factories so the planes wouldn't see what to drop the bombs. They, uh, in those days, they didn't have this sophisticated equipment like we have now with guided missiles and all that. They had to see what to drop the bombs. During the bombardment, a lot of guys used to run to various places where you could, get, where you could steal a piece of bread or whatever they could steal, or cigarettes or something like that. They had what they called the capos. You, anybody know, hear of that? Oh, you did? They used to have Germans. When they opened up the prisons, they brought the Germans in as capos. They had different insignias on their arm. Everybody had a different, the Jewish people had the Star of David on it, <coughs> on the shirt or whatever we had. There was Germans, there was Polacks, there was, um, in a camp where there maybe was 10,000 or so, there might have been maybe about 50 that were non-Jews. There were the Polacks that were in jail at one time, mostly Germans, and they watched over us. 
they didn't actually watch over us. They were there as um, informers, squealers, whatever you want to call them. You know the words, I'm sure, right? Now, if they saw somebody steal something, they didn't say nothing. They waited till we marched home. We stood to attention. They would pick them out. They'd pick them out, and they were hung. Did you ever see, see the hanging things? Okay. They would be hanging there for two, three, four days, maybe longer, with signs. This is what happens when you're caught stealing. Okay. Which was very, very uh, frightening. So the next time, nobody would ever attempt to run around and steal or do something. You know, I, I remember all these things, you know, even when I was a kid. But I did a little stealing too. At one time, the, I used to leave the camp, and they would take me to shine the boots and do things, and they'd have cigarettes laying around, you know. And I would steal the cigarettes and put them between my cheeks, you know. When I said between my cheeks, you know where, okay? And take them back and give them to the guys, because I didn't smoke. But if I was caught, probably would be my last days also. So I did a little stealing myself but for somebody else. So it was, that was the worst thing that I have seen between anybody dropping when they were marching and that's it. They put a bullet in you and kick you aside or if you're caught stealing, you'd be hung. Uh, food, we used to get a little spinach every now and then, they drop it on the ground, they put it into big boilers and we get a little something at night. That was it. The escape, forget it. There was no escape. If sometimes we were, a lot of guys were injured during the bombardment, also killed. They were picked up. They were brought back to the camp. We had crematoriums. And they would immediately, not bury, they put them in a crematorium and burn them. I was right beside my block, which was block 15 in Buchenwald. So as the years or the months went on, went from Buchenwald to Flossenburg, we marched. The war was getting a little rougher and rougher. And we marched. Oh, and one time we marched for about a, almost about two weeks in hail, rain, and it was hell. I hope that nobody that lives would ever experience what I saw and what I have experienced, okay? As I said, I had God watching over me and I think the devil was pushing me. He said, Ben, you drop, you're gone. So here I am and I, I'm able to tell this horrifying thing that we as Jewish people have experienced because we were Jews. And this is something that I hope to God it never happens. I don't care whether they're Jews or Protestants or Catholics or whatever, black or white or Chinese, it was the most horrifying thing that I have experienced in my six years as a kid that I hope to God that none of you ever see it. So um, we went, so I'll tell you a little bit. I, when we were liberated, I uh, met a lot of Americans that liberated me in 1945. And they wanted to take me to America. And I kind of waited. And the Jewish Family Service and the Red Cross and the UNRWA and various other organizations said, my name is not Bernard. It's in Jewish, it's Bendit. B-E-N-D-E-T. They said, Bendit? I said, where, where would you like to go? I said, well, I said, I have relatives in Dublin, Ireland. He said, well, if you want to go there, he said, we can arrange it for you in a matter of weeks. But I said, no, I said, I'd rather wait. I traveled for probably for a good year all over Germany. We had free passes. We could go anywhere we want to in Germany. And they were 
provide transportation for us to see if we can find any of our family. I did find my father, luckily. And um, my father and I, we didn't see eye to eye on certain things, but he's my father. So after I met him and I said, well, what are you doing? He says, I made arrangements, I'm going to France. I said, great, good luck. He said, you want to come? I said, no, I don't think so. I think I'm going to go maybe to Dublin to see my aunts my, on my mother's side. She had two sisters and two brothers in Dublin. I'm sure everybody knows what Dublin Island is, right? Yeah. And um, I learned my trade there. I am, a, by trade, I am a tailor. I'm sure everybody knows what a tailor is. Uh, my uncle had a big factory. I learned my trade. I was also a baker. My aunt owned a bakery, the only Jewish bakery in town. I'm kind of skipping a little bit, so I'll tell you a little bit myself. And I met an Irish lady whom I was married to for 43 years. Okay? I have seven children. They're all doing well in America. I'm not a millionaire, but thank God I raised them and they're all doing well, they're healthy. And I have worked for 20 years in America, gave my kids a fair education. Some of them went, two of them went to college. They all graduated high school. I had two sons in the Navy. And after 20 years, I went into business. I have, I'm here, I'm healthy as a horse and I've done quite well, made a good living, and I have a couple of pennies saved and I enjoy my life. And I've had a wonderful, wonderful life in America, that's all I can tell you. I've lived like a king. And, and uh, that's, you know, the things that, the, the horrifying things that I have experienced is be unexplainable, okay? Why, I don't know. So what you've seen, the lady that have shown you around, uh, that, that is nothing. The horrifying things that we as Jewish people have experienced. I, I really, I can't tell you. I, uh, sometimes here, I have, the first time I spoke and young people asked me various questions, I was here for almost two hours. And you know, you, even in two hours you can't, crowd every can't crowd in six years, which I'm sure you know. So I just wanted to tell you that how grateful I am to be in America. Uh, it's been wonderful, wonderful life that I've had. My kids are well. I, my two sons were in the Navy, which I'm very, very proud of. Uh, and I can't tell you enough how grateful I am to be here. So if anybody would like to ask me something, I, I'll try and my dead best to answer you in every way I can. Anybody have any questions? Yes. How did you find your father? Pardon me? How did you find your father? I found my father, I went around and I had a bicycle, okay? So the town where I was staying was called Kam and there was a neighborhood town which was called Schwandorf. And I asked a lot of the the guys that I was liberated with. And I said, have you seen Ruben Feiner? And after I asked about 10 or 20 guys, they said, yes, Ruben, I was in Kham. And Kham and Schwander were, I think, about maybe, maybe 12 or 15 kilometers away. And at that time on a bicycle, you know, it was nothing. So they said, yes, your dad is in Schwandorf. So I went, pedaled my way to Schwandorf and I met him. And that was, that was the, the way I met him. Thank you. Anybody else? Yes. Did you ever find your aunts or whatever you don't know? Any what? Did you ever find any of your aunts? My aunts? No. No. The, I, my father and I were the only one left, I believe, from what I was told by my aunts and uncle in Dublin, Ireland. I come from a family between my, my mother's side and my dad's side, over, over 300 between cousins, uh, mother-in-laws, father-in-laws, and their children and their grandchildren was 
little somewhere over 300 relatives between the both of the families. My mother came from a rabbinical family. You know what a rabbinical family is? My, okay, she was the daughter of a rabbi. And she was one of eight. So they were all gone. So that's right there between my mother and three other siblings. So right there, that's 11 that, that were gone, that were sent to Auschwitz. And I guess you were told what Auschwitz was all about. Yeah. Anybody else? Yes. What made you settle here? Pardon me? Well, why did you end up here? What made me settle here? Yeah. Okay. Um, I was getting to that. When I was in Dublin, Ireland, I worked for my auntie who had the only Jewish bakery in town. And I used to roll in dough, but not in dough. <laughs> as we call it, in flour. And I worked in a bakery for a while and I didn't like it too well. Then I went to work for my uncle who had a tailoring factory and I went to work for him. And I worked for him for four and a half years as a tailor. That's how I learned my trade, you know, sewing with a needle, machine, cutting. Uh, he was a ladies manufacturer, used to manufacture ladies clothing only, like skirts, jackets, long wear, anything that ladies wear. And um, I worked for him and I'm, I lived with him also. And um, I was getting to an age where, you know, I wanted to make a little money and he didn't give me any money. And I was dating the lady that I married. And um, I asked him for a raise. And he said, you don't need the raise, you're too young and you're too young to have a girl. I said, well, <laughs> so I said, well, uncle, I said, okay. So uh, my wife's name was Susie. And um, so I was about 18, I think. And I said, well, I said, I'm going to make a big change. I, so I talked to my girlfriend and I said, Susie, I said, would you like to go away? She said, where do you want to go away? I said, I want to make a fresh start in my life. I said, all my both aunts, the aunts and uncles were both very, very wealthy. They were filthy rich. And she says, you're crazy. I said, you've got rich family. Where are you going to go? I says, I don't want nothing from nobody. I says, I'm out of here. I said, okay. So I applied to the uh, American consul to migrate to the United States. And after I applied, I filled out various papers with the help of somebody else, because at that time, my English was putrid. It's not so great now, but I'm getting there. I'm self-educated, OK? I have equal to better than high school, only by learning from a book, by going back and forth to the library between Dublin, Ireland, and library, and America. But I have something in between. So anyway, my girlfriend said, where are you going to go? I said, well, I'm applying to go to America. And I filled out the papers. And I went back to the American <coughs> Council. And the guy said, I'm sorry, but you cannot go to America because you're a communist. I said, a communist? I said, what's a communist? He said, you don't know what that is? I said, no. He says, Poland right now is under communism. I said, well, explain to me what communism is. So he started to explain to me. I said, well, forget about it. I said, I can't go. No. I could have gone to America, but a hundred guys wanted to take me when I was liberated by the Americans. And I said, no, I'll go to Dublin. So anyway, I said, there's another way out. So I went to the Canadian consul. And they said, we'd be delighted to have you. I, said, I filled out papers and um, went back to my girlfriend. And I said, Susie, I said, before we go, I said, we'll get married if you want to go. And I said, we're going to Canada. She says, you're kidding. Where's the money coming from? I said, well, I have a few dollars saved up. And I said, I'm borrowing from my friends. And I said, when we get there, I'll pay him back. He said, you're joking. I said, no. Went to my uncle, and I gave him two weeks' notice. And I said, uncle, I'm leaving to go to Canada. He says, you're crazy. I said, no. I'm out of here. <laughs> 
So he went and he talked to my girlfriend, Susie, and he says, can you talk Ben into staying? He says, I'll give him a house, I'll give him a car, I'll give him whatever he wants in salary if he stays. Susie told me this and I said, no. I said, too late. I said, I wouldn't take a penny from him. And I said, making a fresh start. She said, okay. I left Dublin, Ireland with $15 in my pocket after I had paid my fare by boat and went to Montreal. Montreal, I stayed six months and I didn't like it. I worked for a tailoring factory. Uh, the name of the company, I can't never forget it, was Miller Clothing. And they're a big factory, probably about maybe a couple of hundred people employed, and they used to send out salesmen all over Canada. They would take measurements of gentlemen's for suits, and they'd come back with various types of measurements. You would get a sheet, and you cut suits. One guy had a low arm or a short leg, or he wanted everything. You had to go by measurements. So I worked there for six months and I didn't like it. I went to Toronto. Uh, I worked in a factory in Toronto for four and a half years, a company called Beautiful Lingerie. I was a cutter. I diversified myself from the tailoring trade and I done cutting. You know, anybody know what cutting is? Huh? You know, you cut by scissors. Well, you cut with a machine that is this tall that you can probably, um, depends on the height of the machine, you can cut 400 or 500 layers of material. You can probably cut, like say for instance, like you wear a t-shirt like that, you lay up on a long table of maybe 25, 30 hours long, you could cut probably 5,000 garments within three, four hours. So I learned that and then I diversified myself into patterns and I ran a cutting room. So I wasn't satisfied. So I applied again to come to the United States. So that was my goal. So I'm sure all you young people know, there was a general who was named Eisenhower. Anybody remember Eisenhower? Huh? Ike? Okay, he became president, right? Okay, he changed the law that I was able to go as being, I became an Irish citizen, I was there for five and a half years, I was able to go, I was an Irish citizen and married to an Irish gal, I was able to go and come to the United States. So I came to the United States in 19, the end of 1957. And I have done quite well, so that's a little bit of history of the, after all my sufferings that I went through. So I worked for 20 years for one company in the city of St. Louis, which is called Barad Lingerie. I also diversified myself of doing ladies' pajamas and underwear and loungewear and sleepwear and all that kinds of things. I wasn't satisfied there. After 20 years, I went into my own business. And I went to manufacturing also ladies apparel, I left ladies apparel and I manufactured scrubs, which I'm sure, no, scrubs are, yeah? That the nurses wear, scrubs, lab coats and things like that. I provided to a company by the name of Sigma Chemical Company for 20 years and lab coats and I, this was a little bit of, well, done quite well. So this is a little bit of, my story after six years of suffering, I uh, lost everyone in my family, but thank God, I have seven children, I have eight grandchildren, and four great-grandchildren, okay? So, thank God for that. I have something too that I love very, very much. The kids are great, every one of them, so that's all I can tell you that. Yes? I'm sure you saw your father again at some point, but did I saw my. You, you, he went to France. Uh, I saw my father. Believe it or not, uh, he migrated to to St. Louis, and I saw my father here in St. Louis. Yes, 
and um, we saw each other for a while. But uh, I hear he married, and um, I didn't approve of it. But you know that's life. But I I got along. But he lived in an area, one area, and I lived in another one, and uh, it was it was great. He passed away here. Uh, he died of pneumonia. He was in Israel several times, but last time he went to Israel, he came back with pneumonia. I stood by his bedside when he passed away. I watched the monitor going up and down, then it just went straight. It was gone. I mean, you know, he, he was okay, you know, but we just didn't see eye to eye. You know, he was... Uh, one of the reasons mainly, he was a very, very heavy drinker. And I, you know, I, I don't approve. I, you know, everybody takes a beer. I take a beer on occasion, but he used to get fiercely drunk, and he done various things that I didn't approve of. I know I'm, you know, I'm sorry, but you know, he was my father, and you know, we just didn't get see eye to eye. What, my dear? What, what your life was like as a child growing up. Oh, as a child, um, as a child, I went to, uh, in the morning, I went to a school, regular school. I have three grades of Polish school, okay, where you learn the ABC, you know, and in the afternoon, it depends, they alternated, my mother alternated, and then I went to Hebrew school. I don't know if you're familiar, which is, they teach you Judaism. They teach you Hebrew, uh, prayers, and all that. So I went to two schools, okay? That was, and uh, the weather in Poland was horrifying. I used to come in from school, uh, temperature as, at that time I didn't know the readings of the temperature, but I know in what we have here, and I experienced it in Canada, uh, 25 below, 30 below zero. I'd come in from school and my mother used to take my hands and put them in between my, her legs to warm them up. Okay, it was, Poland was horrifying as far as weather-wise. But uh, I, my education in Poland was hardly too minute. Okay, and of course the six years I've experienced uh, we didn't, I didn't get any education at all. So but everything, everything that I know was between Dublin and Montreal. I didn't do nothing as far as education. Six years in Dublin, I did a little, you know, learned quite a bit, you know, by reading. And then the rest of it was all in St. Louis. But as a child, you know, it was, Poland was very, very tough. Very tough. Is that my dear? There was hardly anybody that was of my age. I think I, there might have been maybe one or two, but there might have been a couple of years older than I was. Uh, you, you, can't, you could never say too much, which I'm sure everybody knows. You have to, the, the less you said, the better you're off. Uh, we had no time, you know, whatever we talked to each other on occasions, you know, uh, you, you, you can't say too much. It was very, very, very tough. You keep to yourself and go to bed at night. We slept four or five in a bed, you know. So uh, that's how it kept warm. But nothing, anything ever happened, you know, that was drastic. But we all, we got along great amongst everybody. We, we had to, you know, in order to stay alive, you had to get along. Yes? You seem to be really well at peace with yourself. What kind of processes did you have to go through to overcome the hate that you had to have had for these people, what they did to you. Well, let me say this. Um, I am probably a very, very unusual fella, okay? I have no hate, even right now. I have a few German friends that I know. I don't carry hate, and I hardly ever lose my temper. I was married to 40, for 43 years to a lady by the name of Susan Christina O'Brien, 
and I've never had an argument with her. Whatever she wanted, I gave her. When I had money, she said, Benny, she used to call me Benny. She said, where can we go? I said, Susie, you have a checkbook? I don't know, you keep it, whatever you want, whatever you want to go, whatever you do, go ahead and do it. You know, I have no hate, believe me. I have no hate for nobody. Uh, I've mixed with every nationality in the world, okay? We had Jews from Romania, Bulgaria, Czechoslovakia, from all over that the Germans could pick up from Europe and brought to the concentration camps. At one time I spoke probably maybe 16, 17 languages. You know, when you're a kid, you pick it up, you talk to all these guys. I'm still down to about, of course the poorest one is English. <laughs> I speak Polish, I speak German, I speak a little Russian, a little Hungarian, maybe a little Czechoslovakian. If you, you know, they say if you use it, great, but if you, do, if you don't use it, you lose it. So, but I do speak fluently probably about six languages. But as far as the hate, sir, I have no hate. I, I do not dwell on the past. I'd like to forget what it was. Only for this beautiful lady there, I wouldn't be here today. Okay, and I thank God for that because it kind of makes me feel a little better because I'm doing it, okay? And so that your young people will know that hopefully none of you will ever see this kind of thing that I have seen and the suffering and the ha hunger and the starvation. When I came out of the camp, okay, I was um, almost 16 years old, okay? I weighed 65 pounds, okay? So that'll give you an idea how I looked. And another thing, I, I used to reach in like this and I would, you guys know what Lysa? Everybody does? I used to be able to reach in and just drop them like that. It took me six months of various types of things to get rid of the lice out of my body and my head. Because my head was shaved. Everybody's head was shaved. So, you know, but they were still there. They used to shave you every other month. But they're still because you, you hardly ever... I think I... Um, well, in the... And it's funk slug and the first labor camps we used to take a shower every now and then. But in the concentration camp, we got a shower by accident, maybe once a month, but we're doing good. So yes, anybody else please? Yes. The what? What kept you going? What kept me going? Uh, as I mentioned before, I, I think God watched over me and the devil was pushing me and thank God, you know, I am 78 years old. I have never been sick a day in my life. I had two little minor things that I had. Uh, I had polyps that busted inside of me and I bled for two and a half days. I lived in Palm Beach, Florida. And I think also God was watching over me and I went to the emergency, I took my dog with me. I had a golden retriever and I left him sit in the car and I went in, you know, and um, they put me on the banana cart as we, they call it. And the doctor said to me, how did you get here? I said, I drove. I said, somebody left to take my dog back in my car. It's parked outside. He says, you have an hour to live. I said, you're joking. I said, no. He says, your engine is operating on one quart oil, okay? So that's how lucky I was. I could have probably kicked the bucket if I wouldn't have gone. I was bleeding for two and a half days out of my, excuse me, saying my rectum, the polyps. So this was one incident in my life. And I've had a little incident uh, about two months ago. I had a blood vessel busted in me and I let it go too long also, but they cut that in time. So other than that, I have never been sick a day in my life. I am very, very, I am probably the most, the luckiest and most fortunate guy in the world for my age. Uh, I put on a little weight. I just got off a cruise, okay? And uh, I think I put on about 10 pounds. I was about 190 or less, but I was eating too much, so I have a little bit. But I am very, very fortunate to be alive, thank God, to tell beautiful people like you 
and I hope you'll never see any hardship what we as Jewish people have experienced. As you know, over six million people went because they were just Jews. And that's a horrifying thing, you know. And thank God I'm here, and I'm well, and you know something? I'm going to be around for a long time to enjoy it. Well, I, I could never, we inquired to where my mother and siblings, they went to Auschwitz immediately with many all other old people that could, uh, probably within a few weeks after the war started when we went in the, in the forced labor camp that everybody went to Auschwitz. And of course, they told people that went into a shower and when they showered, they put a gas bomb in and then they went to the gas chamber and all I know is they were gone. And that was, that's all I, that's all. They were, they went in, gone. All, all the relatives, like I said, my father and I are the only ones left out of over 300 relatives. And how, how old were your brothers and your sister? My, and then my, my sister and also a newborn that has not, as we say, has not even been Chris or into Judaism. She was only a week old, and she went with my mother. So three children went with my mother. And um, tell them about... Uh, when we were liberated in Calm, it was approximately around between 9.30 and 10 o'clock when nobody had a watch. Uh, the American tank cannon was a fort, and they liberated us. And when they liberated us, they knew who we were because they were told that you know, we were marching. And immediately when they got out from the tanks, they said, you go this way. And the, the, we were right beside the forest in Bavaria. This was calm is in Bavaria. And uh, the Germans, the Nazis that watched over us, they ran into the forest. And of course, the tanks threw in the, fame, the flamethrowers that came. I'm sure uh, your elderly gentlemen know what the things uh, came out of the tanks. And uh, we were liberated and of course, it took a little, a few hours later, they put us on trucks and they took us into the city and they set us up. And believe it or not, uh, probably from my knowledge that I have seen, at least probably 75 or 100 died because they couldn't wait to get their hands on eating and a lot of them died from, from eating good food because they just they couldn't, they couldn't handle it. It was so bad. I mean, uh, they were totally gone berserk. So the food that they were eating, they couldn't handle and they died also from, from, eating, from eating good food. Um, any other questions? Um, I just want to say the reason, you know, it's so wonderful that Ben is, is speaking is because he, a lot of survivors don't even tell their, their children the stories because it's very painful. It's very painful to relive it. It's very painful to hear about it. And I'm sure you all have lots of secrets that you keep to yourself that you just don't want people to know about. But as we know, what's happening now is we need to know, we need to know what happened. And in fact, what's happening in Germany, they're you know, uncovering all kinds of documentation, detail, everything that happened there. And as the years go by, we won't have survivors to give an eyewitness account. Um, yeah, Steven Spielberg's Shoah Foundation has 52,000 eyewitness testimonies as to what happened, and they're all digitalized, cataloged, so you can go on you know, certain computers and actually put in a name of a city, and you'll see all the people who grew up there and gave testimony as to what happened. You know, it's not, not very many places have um, survivor speakers telling their story, telling what happened as an eyewitness, and Ben was a little boy. You know, yeah. he literally grew up in the camp. Yeah, I said something else. Uh, I want to be just for the beautiful lady mentioned. Uh, when I was, in the, you know, in Judaism, when you become 13, you become a man. Does you, you young folks know about that, young folks? A bar mitzvah. Bar mitzvah. You know about that? Some of you do. I'm sure you do. Okay. Now, I was bar mitzvahed in West Palm Beach, Florida, four years ago. Yes, because he was denied yeah. that as a child. I was denied that as a child, which was very, very important to me. 
Okay, and another thing I want to mention something. Um, as Marcy, Ms. Rosenberg mentioned, I have never mentioned to them what the sufferings that I went through. My wife, their mother, mentioned to them, your dad was in such and such a place. And on occasion they used to say, Dad, can you tell us about it? I said, we'd rather not talk about it. I said, we live, we're doing well, forget about it. Up to this lady, otherwise they didn't know nothing about it because I got my children together when this lady interviewed me and I tried to also crowd in. Finally, and I lived in West Palm. I left St. Louis for a while. I sold my home and um, I lived there for a while. The phone rang. I picked up the phone. Is this Bernard Feiner? I said, I said, I liberated you on the 23rd of April of 1945 approximately 10 o'clock in the morning. I said, you're joking. I says, no, I'm not. I said, some He says, I have proof and I'll show you. So he says, where are you? I said, I'm in Wellington. I'm right off of Forest Hill. He says, I live 10 minutes from you. Can I come down or do you want to come to me? I said, I'm a little younger than you are. I said, I was a child or a kid. I says, I'll be there in five minutes. I said, wait till I get my shoes on. And I was there, I walked in the door, guy put his arms around me and he cried. So that was the most wonderful thing that ever happened to me. So, in fact, I just got back and I wanted to see him and he said, well, I'm going away for Thanksgiving to my relative with my daughter and he says, come the day after Thanksgiving. I said, I went down to see him and he wasn't there. I couldn't find him. He must be in a hospital, maybe very, very ill. And I've been trying to get a hold of him the last couple of days and I couldn't. So I'm going to try again today. So he must be very, very ill because he, he, he was dying to see me. And I didn't see him. So I'm going to keep calling all this week to see him. And if he's in the hospital, I'm going to fly to see him. Okay, that's a good story. Anything else? Thank you for coming. Thank you so much for coming. and. Remember, thank you. Thanks a lot, it's been a pleasure. Thank you.